Okay, so um, I'm going back to those equations that I displayed uh, before. Those are the equations I told you that allow you to determine the internal perturbation that then will be matched smoothly with the external perturbation, and that will determine that all-important quantity, the left number that relates the tidal field to the deformation of the body. And one point I wanted to make before moving on is that the uh, structure of the unperturbed body, and by that I mean the exact distribution of mass and density inside the body, and the details of the perturbation inside the body, all of that depends on the equation of state. And if we're going to turn that into a concrete calculation of the love number, the first thing you have to decide is, what will be my choice of equation of state? And here you have a lot of freedom. You can go back to your nuclear physics friends and say, what's your favorite model? And you can implement this. Or uh, what I'm going to do here instead is to do something very crude and uh, declare that the equation of state will simply be a polytropic form of this kind. And polytrope is just, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> just terminology for a power law relationship between the pressure and the density. So K is a constant. The important thing here is that we have pressure being proportional to rho raised to some power, and for some uh, you know, reason, that power is expressed as 1 plus 1 over M. So uh, a large power means a lot of pressure for the same amount of density that's stiff, that produces a large body. Uh, the, uh, the, a low power means less pressure for a given density that produces a small body. So what turns out to be important for us is, uh, is not so much the size of the body that comes with you know, the five powers of the body radius, that's an important aspect, but for the love number, what matters is a scale-free version of uh, that aspect of you know, how the mass is distributed inside the star. And I wanted to sort of illustrate this here. So what I have here are curves of density divided by the central density at the center as a function of r normalized to the body radius, big R. So they all start at 0, and they all go to 1. And what I have is curves that are presented in order of n. And what you have to understand here is that as n increases, the power decreases. So n small corresponds to a, low, a, a, a large power. And n large, corresponding to this curve here, corresponds to a low power. So n small over here corresponding to a high power means a very stiff equation of state. And what a stiff equation of state does in terms of density distribution is to push the matter around so that it occupies you know, a large volume inside that normalized star. The matter is diffusely distributed across the star. If you go to the other extreme where n is large, or probably you probably can't read those values here, but if n is large, this curve over here, you have a low power over here, which means that you have less pressure to fight against gravity, and that means that the body will have a centralized distribution of density. Most of the matter is going to be in the inner layers of the star, and very little will be distributed in the outer layers. So a stiff equation of state gives you a star that is almost uniformly distributed, in density, almost, and uh, versus you know a very soft equation of state that gives you a very centrally dense star with a very diffuse, you know, a very dense distribution of matter with very little in the outer layers. The love number is a dimensionless measure of, uh, say, the quadrupole deformation, which is the integral of rho times r squared. So if rho is all at the center. Rho times r squared will be a small, uh, you know, the integral of that will be very small. If rho is distributed like this throughout the star, rho times r squared, the integral of that will be a large number. That's what you see here uh, in the actual numerical values for the love numbers in those cases. If n is small and you have a model like this, the love number will be large because the integral of rho r squared will, you know, 
we build up from all those contributions and uh, you obtain a large number like this. At the other extreme, if n is uh, large uh, and the equation of state is very stiff and you have a distribution like this, the integral of rho r squared will give you a small number and you see this. So as n increases and the equation becomes softer, the love number decreases. So it's in this way that you can think of measuring the love number through any means like gravitational waves as telling you something about the distribution of density inside the object, and that in turn tells you something about the equation of state. It's that relationship that we're really interested in. So that's a Newtonian calculation. I've shown you how to uh, do all of this in Newtonian theory. The key physics input, as always, is the equation of state. So now I'm going to tell you how to do this in general relativity. And uh, the point of this part of the story is that the details change, but the elements of what is required, so all of the ingredients that are required to do the calculation, are exactly the same. And the key input is, again, the equation of state. There is one thing that changes, though, in a major way. In Newtonian physics, there's only one type of tides. In GR, there are two types. And that's a very new ingredient, uh, and uh, I want to explain this uh, uh, before we get going. And there are three ways of understanding why there should be two types of tides in general relativity. The first way has to do with the fact that, as we all know, how do we describe tidal effects in general relativity? Well, we do this in terms of the Riemann tensor. Let me switch the Riemann tensor to the Weyl tensor. That's the part of the Riemann tensor that has nothing to do with Ricci, therefore has nothing to do algebraically with matter. So let me focus on the Weyl tensor. The Weyl tensor for any space-time has 10 independent components. And what I can do is to split them up into 5 and 5 if I introduce a vector field. If I introduce a timeline vector field in my space-time, I can think of those projections as defining a symmetric trace-free tensor uh, that's purely orthogonal to that vector field, and that gives me five of the ten components. If I take the dual of the via tensor and then do the projection, I get the five additional components. Newtonian tides, and I'm using the curly E notation here, not by accident, uh, the Newtonian tides correspond to those five components of the vial tensor. The new tides that we get in GR correspond to those five components. So we have the E tides and we have the B tides. And that simply has to do with the fact that there's more into curvature in general relativity because of the 10 independent components than there is in purely Newtonian physics that's you know, limited to those five uh, components. We are missing out in Newtonian gravity the, uh, the, the, the five components associated with the dual of the vial tensor. So that's one way of understanding this. Another way of understanding this is, uh, you know, perhaps more intuitive. And instead of thinking in full GR, let me think in terms of post-Newtonian theory. In post-Newtonian theory, which is basically Newtonian theory plus a little bit of relativistic corrections, I can think of uh, the gravitational field as being described by two potentials, a scalar potential and a vector potential. The scalar potential is basically an immediate generalization of the Newtonian potential, and that would be associated with GTT, and also in post-Newtonian theory associated with the space-space components of the metric. And in post-Newtonian theory, the equation for U is almost the same as the Newtonian equation. We get that, uh, the, you know, that the scalar potential is sourced by mass density. But we get a little bit more than this in post Newtonian theory. If we look at the time-space components of the metric, we can think of this as a vector potential. And the field equation for that vector potential will be, again, the Laplace type equation. Sorry, I messed up. A. And that is sourced by not mass density, but mass currents. It's rho times V that matters here, and the vector potential is sourced by masses in motion. 
when you look at this and you remember your ENM, that looks precisely like what we get in uh, electromagnetism. We get a scalar potential for the electric field absorbed by charge density. And we get a vector potential for our magnetic field that is sourced by you know, charge currents, which is basically charge density multiplying velocity. We have a very close analogy. The details, I mean, this is just very uh, schematic. The details are different, but there's a very strong analogy between uh, electromagnetism and post newtonian gravity. So we can think of gravity as being split into an electric description and a magnetic description. This is the electric description. That's what we inherit from the Newtonian theory. That's the familiar stuff. And then anything that has to do with mass motion is something that can be thought of as producing a gravitational equivalent to a magnetic field. We call it the gravitomagnetic field. That is described by the vector potential. And, uh, and that is something that we don't have in Newtonian gravity, and that's something that GR gives us. The analogy is made even closer by the fact that if you look at the forces in a Newtonian language uh, created by those potentials, you get that a force acting on a, on a mass is going to be of the Lorentz type form, where you get an electric field produced by the gradient of U and a magnetic field produced by the curl of A, and there's a Lorentz type force uh, acting on particles uh, in, uh, in this Newtonian, sort of post Newtonian version of general relativity. So this analogy is quite close. The point is this if we know that Newtonian gravity produces tides and Newtonian gravity is associated with a scalar potential, we should certainly expect that having this new ingredient to uh, general relativity coming from the vector potential, we should expect that potential to also produce tides, but those tides will have a very different character from the Newtonian tides. So this produces gravitoelectric tides, that's the familiar stuff, but now we have this new ingredient, gravitomagnetic tides. And basically, I'm saying in a different language, the same thing that I was saying here, we either present the split in this way or present the split in that way. Regardless, we have the familiar tides and we have the new tides coming from moving masses as opposed to uh, you know, masses that would be still. There's a third way of describing this, and now that you're experts in black hole perturbation theory, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, we have a split of a perturbation in terms of even parity and odd parity. Well, the familiar stuff that is recovered in Newtonian theory is the even parity stuff, and that's what you were looking at yesterday. I didn't go into the odd parity stuff, but the odd parity stuff is, is this over here. So we get even parity tides, we get odd parity types, tides, and it's either the split like this, the split like that, or the split in parity. It's all the same, you know, uh, way of, you know, different ways of describing the same thing. And basically, that's why in GR we get more types of tides, and therefore the situation becomes more interesting because we have new tidal phenomena that are not present in Newtonian physics. So, what I'll do here is to just describe how the familiar tides, the, uh, the gravitoelectric tides, are generalized from Newtonian physics to general relativity. And then I'll say a little bit about the, uh, the gravitomagnetic tides, which are novel and uh, less familiar. So, in Newtonian physics, we had a set of governing equations. The same story is true in GR. The identity of the equations, of course, is different. Instead of Poisson's equation for the Newtonian potential, we get the full set of Einstein field equations. We get a relativistic version of Euler's equation. I'm still assuming a perfect fluid, but now it's become relativistic. We still have a continuity equation. Here I'm distinguishing what is rest mass density from what is the total mass energy density of my fluid. We still have the pressure variable. That's the mass conservation equation. That's Euler's equation. And as always, we need an equation of state, which I will take to be a one-parameter family of equations of state, where we ignore anything having to do with entropy or uh, temperature. That's the generalization from uh, Newtonian physics to full general relativity. We have a description of an unperturbed body that in isolation would be spherically symmetric, that uh, we get by specializing all of this to a static, spherically symmetric situation that gives rise to the familiar 
Tolman Oppenheimer Volkoff equations that you've probably all seen and perhaps even solved in some models. So we start there, that's our unperturbed body, and then we add on the perturbation, which means that all the variables that are found here will be given in terms of a background value plus a perturbation. That happens with the metric, it will happen for the mass density, it will happen for uh, the fluid velocity, because even though we keep the fluid static, uh, there's still a time component to the velocity vector that will be perturbed uh, as we turn on the tidal effect. So that's how we do perturbation theory in uh, general relativity. But again, it's very much the same story we had before. It's just that now the technical difficulties uh, are increased. But uh, conceptually, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, as you know, we have to do all of this by imposing a gauge condition, so I could do all of this uh, working in Reggie Wheeler gauge, and uh, the equations would simplify, and uh, we would still have to do the usual stuff, expansion in spherical harmonics, stare at the whole mess, try to find ways to simplify them into decoupled equations, all of that. So now you're all experts at doing this, I could set you off on a path to, you know, do all of this stuff. So what do you get? Well, after you work a little bit, what you find is uh, an equation that nicely decouples for the TT component of the metric perturbation. So yesterday I showed you how to do that and we selected HRR to be the decoupled variable, but you know HRR and HTT were almost the same thing, so we could have worked in terms of one or the other. Here I choose to work in terms of HTT. That's been decomposed in spherical harmonics, that's gonna be my, uh, my reduced variable here that depends only on radius, and when I'm done, I get the same type of equations, uh, the equation we got in Newtonian physics for the Newtonian potential. The only thing that changes is that we have slightly more complicated functions appearing here and here, but other than that, it's still a simple second order ordinary differential equation that I can solve almost, uh, you know, well, in the same way that I solved the Newtonian equation. In the same way, I have to match the internal solution to the external solution. The external solution you know all about. The external solution will contain a growing piece that corresponds to the tidal field and a decaying piece that corresponds to the uh, deformation of the body. Yesterday, we did it for L equals 2. We can do it for arbitrary L. It's exactly the same thing. So this is the growing piece. This is the decaying piece. I insert here all the complexities of the uh, external solution into that coefficient A, coefficient B. And the matching of the internal solution to the external solution will give me, uh, you know, the uh, relativist uh, relativistic version of the love number. It's exactly the same story, but now my love number has been ported to general relativity. I notice one thing, and that's something you noticed yesterday, the growing solution to uh, my perturbation equations is perfectly regular at r equals 2m, but the decaying solution, the one that describes the deformation of my body, would be singular at r equals 2m. If I'm dealing with a material body, I'm not concerned by that singularity. The body is larger than 2m, so the singularity never occurs. But if I want to use this formalism to describe the, 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 the deformation of a black hole, uh, in the presence of a tidal field, I have to make sure that this solution never arises, and that instructs me to set the love numbers to zero, not just for L equals two, but for all of them. Again, the singularity of that solution is what uh, tells me that the love numbers of black holes have to be zero. But here, I'm more interested in neutron stars. I don't have, so uh, for a neutron star, this part of the solution is very much relevant, and I get to the love number here, simply by matching my internal solution, solution to this, to that external solution. That's how we get the love numbers. Um, there's a similar exercise that will give you the gravitomagnetic part of the story. So that's all the generalization from Newtonian physics to GR concerning the gravitoelectric tides. I can formulate also uh, you know, the, the problem of calculating the gravitomagnetic love numbers by looking at the odd parity part of the perturbation and solving that in the inside and matching that to the outside. I won't go through the, you know, the calculation here, I won't describe that in any more detail, but I have one variable over here that comes from the time-space component of the metric, 
That becomes my primary variable. I have to solve it inside. I have to match it to a similar looking external solution. And that brings uh, to the fore here a magnetic version or a gravitomagnetic version of that love number. I have two sets of love, love, numbers, love numbers now because I have those two types of, star, uh, of tides, you know, gravitoelectric, gravitomagnetic. And uh, so, of course, the tidal effects are, are different. So here it's a tidal effect that has to do with, uh, you know, masses in motion as opposed to static masses. So the point here is not to uh, necessarily understand the technical details, but it's to understand that what we did in the Newtonian problem finds a version that is just only slightly altered in general relativity. So if you can do it in Newtonian physics, you can, you know, with very slight, you know, changes, do it in gravitational physics as well. And here's an exercise where I calculated those love numbers. I'm talking about the familiar gravitoelectric love numbers for the same sort of polytropes that we talked about in, uh, in Newtonian physics. Also with the polytropic index here, and that ranges from the small value to a large value. The uh, small value for m uh, corresponding to a stiff equation of state corresponding to a large star gives me this curve over here, and the large values of m corresponding to a very soft equation of state and a small star will give me that curve over here. So I'm plotting here the love number as a function of the stellar compactness, the ratio of, in this case, 2m divided by r. So this is dimensionless in uh, relativistic units. It goes from zero for a very, very large star that would be well described by Newtonian physics to uh, one for a black hole. So if I were to push this all the way to one for a black hole, uh, that would be, you know, that would be the black hole state would be uh, compactness equals to one. I'm doing this for a neutron star, and what happens is that I never reach one because before I reach the black hole state, I reach the maximum mass possible for a neutron star. That's why those curves are terminating. So what do we see here? Well, if we look at the value of the love number for compactness equals zero, we're basically reproducing the Newtonian prediction for the love number because for very small compactness, relativistic effects become very unimportant and I'm reproducing Newtonian physics. So those values here that I get on the axis are precisely the same values that I listed before when I computed them purely in Newtonian physics. I reproduce those values here. And we get a large love number when the equation is very stiff, and we get a very small love number when the equation is very soft. What we see in addition to that is that as we turn on general relativity, we get that the compactness uh, so tends to decrease the love number. So as we plot the love number as a function of compactness and we force the star to become more and more compact by turning on relativity, we see that the love number decreases. And again, that has to do with the fact that if the star is more compact, you get most of your density near the center and that tends to reduce the integral of rho r to the you know, two, uh, second power and that produces a small love number. So you can reduce the love number either by changing the equation of state or you can reduce the love number by uh, forcing the star to be more compact. And of course, at some point you reach a limit where you reach the maximum compactness. Beyond that, the star would just collapse to a black hole. Yep? Um, so you see how they kind of plotted these three points? Uh, yeah. Does that mean that you can't write the compactness as a function of... Uh, no. Sorry, the that's right. So there's no analytical formula that gives me this. I have to do a whole sequence of numerical calculations to get each value and yeah, that reflects how many points I actually did calculate uh, for, for this exercise. Yep? Um, so going back to your expressions for the radio electric or radio magnetic um, for the, the Yep. Yep. Yes and no. So that's an interesting aspect of the calculation. So the, the, the determination of the tidal environment in the 
physics is very uh, easy to do because you have a linear theory and that tells you that the total uh, uh, Newtonian potential is just the sum of your body potential plus the remote body potential. So in that context, the determination of curly E is very simple to achieve. In GR, we're dealing with a nonlinear theory. So the determination of curly E, given that you're dealing with a remote mass in orbital motion, uh, can be very tricky to achieve. And that's something that I won't talk about at all. The beautiful thing about doing tidal physics is that well, everything depends on curly E, and you can leave curly E as a general tensor field that depends only on time. You can you know, leave the specification of the tidal environment, namely the precise specification of curly E, to a later stage, and you can still do all of the local tidal physics with a generic curly E for which you know nothing. So you can completely separate the two problems. So it's a, it's a nice advantage because you can basically keep the two things separate, and in fact, they require very different approaches. Yep? All right, can you go back to the <coughs> plot that you had? Yep. Yeah, so on the y-axis, is this a dimension to this? Mm -hmm. so this is? So this scaling of compactness is not just r to the five. No, that's that's beyond. So, this so, so yeah, so the love number is a dimension-free, or a dimensionless version of the deformation regardless of the scale, uh, you know, the actual scale of the object, that's carried out by that r to the fifth power. So yeah, it's a scale-free version of that, uh, of that deformation. So in Newtonian physics, uh, this love number is just a constant. Yep. And yeah. you are... You, you have that full system. curve uh, because the love number depends on compactness. So the idea, and I'm not going to make that very precise here, is that through gravitational waves, you have access to the love number. Through the in spiral, you also have access to the mass. So by measuring a love number, well, you have partial information about the equation of state. You have partial information about the compactness. It becomes a little bit, uh, you know, all, uh, it, it becomes a little bit degenerate. But nevertheless, if you can measure the love number, you have access to uh, information about either both the compactness of the star and its equation of state sort of packaged together like this. It's not full information, you cannot do everything with it, but uh, you know, it gives you a handle on the mass distribution inside a neutron star. So that's, uh, that's the interest and you know, that, that was the theme of this lecture. Yep? Are you trying to at least do like a simple tether I never tried, probably you could. I mean, it, it might require a few terms to do justice, and I guess given the uncertainties, you wouldn't care about, you know, getting really, really good fits, but yeah, I'm sure you could fit that to, uh, to, something, uh, to something decent. Although, uh, let me anticipate, you know, the next question. This was for polytrope, which is really a really crude model for a neutron star equation of state. People have repeated this calculation for much more uh, plausible models, but now you have a whole catalog of plausible equations of state, and they all differ in their specifics. So you can repeat the calculation for all of those, uh, you know, plausible models, and you get this spread of curves. So those smooth curves over here are the same polytropes that I described before. But if you actually build in something that looks like a more realistic version of the equation of state, as provided to you by nuclear <coughs> physicists, well, you will get curves that look like this, and you can see the spread. Right? The, the spread measures the uncertainty of the equation of state which means that before you can infer something specific about the nuclear matter equation of state for the love number calculation, hopefully you have to you know, clear out this mess and try to make this more constrained. Anyway, so there's a trade-off between what you can learn purely from nuclear physics and what you can learn from gravitational wave measurements. So here's the same kind of plot where we've got love number as a function of compactness. Here we're missing the factor of two. And that's just to show that with the uncertainty that we have, regarding the precise nature of the nuclear equation of state, uh, you know, that relationship is really poorly constrained. And of course, we hope to do better in the future, but that's still you know, a big part of the story here, how we can learn about nuclear physics from gravitational wave measurements, and hopefully also from other sources of astronomical observations. Yeah, you were? Yeah, one question. What, uh, when you are talking about measuring, what, the gravitational density, the number, the gravitational 
allow you. So there's a dominant effect that comes from the graph-related type. So when you look at modeling gravitational waves, including the type of interaction, of course, in principle, all of this comes together. But there's an effect that dominates, and the effect that dominates comes from uh, that K2 graph-related uh, So that's the dominant source of the tidal impact on the gravitational waves. So that would be more accessible to measurement than the other results. But of course, as the model gets defined, as the measurements improve, uh, you'll be able to measure more than one thing, and that, you know, that's going to be also very interesting to extract the statistics. Uh, we have another question here. Yeah. Uh, so, the, yeah, so you have the red lines and you have the, uh, the black lines, and I forget the details, but they're uh, the black lines and the red lines are based on equations of space that assume different matter models. So in one case, I forget which, I think the dashed lines, uh, you allow for phase transitions to chaon condensates or hyperons and things like that, where the black lines, I think you just assume uh, protons and neutrons for your matter uh, model in equations of space. In the end, it doesn't seem to matter very much, uh, you know, the uncertainty either way. Uh, this, so I don't know what that is, I don't remember, and all of the gray lines here are just simple probabilities. So when I look at this, and I know that I'm ne never going to do justice to the nuclear physics, I can conclude that a polytrope between uh, you know, n equals 1 and n equals a half does a pretty decent job. Those are the compactness that you can expect for realistic uh, neutron stars. So, uh, so I can choose to be crude, I can choose to be more sophisticated, in the end it probably I'm happy with all the shows for most of the way. Other questions? Okay, so I think I'm going to be uh, stopping almost here. I just wanted to show you that uh, the calculation can also be done for the gravitomagnetic love numbers. And here we have a similar plot where we're looking at uh, the gravitomagnetic love number as a function of compactness, pretty much the same sort of thing I had before for the you know, gravity of electric love number, you'll notice here that we have two branches, a positive branch and a negative branch. I won't go into that. That has to do with what you assume the state of the fluid to be. There's some interesting physics there, but I think I've gone on long enough and that would, you know, take some time to explain. So let me not dwell on this, but let me, you know, so that was just to show that uh, you can, in fact, uh, you know, calculate both types of love numbers and one day, uh, all of that will be incorporated in gravitational wave models, and hopefully we'll learn something about the internal structure of neutron stars through gravitational wave measurements. Yep? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, when we go to, to zero compactness, and the first Newtonian limit, what is the mean limit? Is it like 0 0.5 or 0 0.5? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like 0 0.5 or 0 0.5. Right. So, uh, so yeah, so there's, so there's certainly a limit to, uh, to very small compactness that you can... Uh, that you can draw here, uh, but it's not quite a Newtonian limit. It's, it's, you know, it's really, that's a love number that would occur in post-Newtonian theory already with a factor of 1 over c squared incorporated. So the limit is not a Newtonian limit, it's really a post-Newtonian limit. And the reason why I have circles here is that I was able to calculate these things in post-Newtonian theory uh, in that approximation, and I was able to reproduce the numerical value. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's not meant to suggest that there's a Newtonian limit to that. Do you have a second part? Okay, I thought you said two quick questions. That's fine. Uh, so, yeah, so I wanted to uh, basically stop here. I'll just say one more thing, and something that you already know. Uh, if you do this for a black hole, well, now you have to conclude that uh, the love number for a black hole is zero, and that's true for the gravitoelectric love numbers. It's true for the gravitomagnetic love numbers. Uh, that might be suggested by this plot, for example, if you were to extrapolate all the way to one, I mean, all of those curves seem to go to zero in that limit, although it's hard to extrapolate reliably from 0.7 to one. It's sort of suggested that as you increase the compactness, the love numbers get smaller and smaller. Uh, there's no black hole limit from a neutron star because, you know, if you try to make it more compact, it will become gravitationally unstable, it will collapse to a black hole, so there's no static limit to a black hole. 
but nevertheless, you can show by doing a separate calculation, as you did yesterday, that uh, the left number for a black hole has to be zero. And that is certainly uh, telling us that the Tyler interaction between two black holes will be insignificant. And that's why we want neutron stars to create those tidal, uh, those tidal effects that are so exciting because they can reveal something about the nature of the body. Uh, so if you don't measure anything in terms of tidal modulation, uh, you cannot conclude anything. But if you do measure something, uh, now you can start saying something about the nature of the body. And that uh, is something that I think will be very exciting for the next, next five to ten years or something like that. I don't know if, uh, if Jonathan is going to tell us more about this, but anyway, that's going to be a, the end of my story here. So I really had a great time with you this week. I'll stick around until the end of the week, uh, so by all means, continue to talk to me. I, I, I really enjoyed this interaction. I hope you enjoyed the lectures. Thank you very much for your attention. Any remaining questions? Yep. Um, so I was wondering, uh, just about something you said earlier, about um, uh, max finding uh, time signatures and then like, taking away emissions from a binary neutron star and somehow that might tell us about the equation of space. Right. And um, as far as I understand, there are no, there's no kind of time involved in holding all the modes in neutron stars. But oh, there, there, there are. There. Okay. Yeah. And a bunch of other ones that you mentioned just Right. So, so here, everything that I did here, of course, was restricted to a static or nearly static situation. What can happen if you have two very small neutron stars that get so close together that the orbital time scale becomes comparable to the uh, internal hydrodynamical time scale, what you can do is to start exciting the plus normal modes of oscillations of the neutron star, and you can produce resonance type effects that, uh, in fact, can be, uh, could be measured. So the prospect for this is a little bit limited because that tends to be a high frequency phenomenon that occurs just on the outside of the lighter frequency band. But if, uh, but you know, under the right conditions, if you're optimistic, you can actually see those resonance uh, type phenomena in a gravitational wave. So at some point, close to merger or even during merger, you would see a large peak in the gravitational wave amplitude that appears to be a frequency, and that would be uh, you know, the dominant frequency. because the frequency band is not uh, is not sufficient for this. There's certainly talk of trying to build high frequency detectors, perhaps by remodulating the optics within the lighter detector to try to have access to those uh, <coughs> so that's yeah, so that's a, you know something I didn't talk about at all, but it's also very promising in terms of saying something about the general structure. all possibilities, so not just from gravitational waves, but also from astronomical measurements. So any handle that you have, and the more handles you have, will tell you more. If you're limited to one technique, you won't learn as much as you should. So, so yeah, so I mean, the spiral stuff, the tidal modulation stuff is one aspect. The merger physics is certainly another aspect. Uh, and hopefully we'll have access to all of that physics.
Yeah, we could also get stuff close to draw people higher than here or in society if people want to see maybe a higher or higher percent. Again, we're the same numbers if you organize a group, a group ticket. And then finally, also, there's a festival on at the moment, so there's also going to be shows of James Joyce and Peter Seuss. Um, so, if anybody's a big James Joyce fan, that's going to be showing on Saturday in the evening. So, we're just going to leave uh, a piece of paper there. If you're interested in any of these things, just write your name. or maybe people have to pay you either if we just get the numbers today and I can tell people what kind of prices we'd be looking at tomorrow. And um, if for the USC state you can just write if you are interested if you're interested for Saturday evening or Sunday evening. And then also if people were interested in going for a drink later on tonight, if people look for Connor later on, and um, he was gonna try around with a few people and just go to the local speaking bar and maybe have some food. Again, just look for Connor after the end of the lectures later on today, and he'll reply to people there. Okay, is there anything else? Okay, everyone One more oh, time. Um, on Thursdays in UCD, there's a food market. Well, we're just past where we had the, the workshop yesterday. So when you get to work, where you go to the workshop, you would have gone right into the building. You just look at 20 meters to the left. There's a food market. Unfortunately, because of the winds, That's on a lunchtime today, so if you want to take a bit more of a walk, I think it's nice and sunny out today, so you can sit out outside there. Yeah. That's my recommendation for lunch. Oh, and they only accept cash, so make sure you cash.